Good evening. Good evening. For those who don't know me, I'm Pastor Billets. I sober over in Alma City and Smith's Mill, and good to see you here tonight. We'll follow the order of service that's printed for us in our bulletin. Our series this year is called Crucial Hours. Tonight we'll talk about how they bound Jesus. And we'll begin with our opening hymn this evening, Before the Ending of the Day. All the stuff is printed for you in the bulletin there. Congregation may arise. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, and in all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver and restore us that we may rest in peace. 
by the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, and in him we are forgiven. Let us rest in his peace until the rising of the sun, when we shall serve him in newness of life. Amen. Congregation may be seated. We'll join in singing our psalm this evening, Psalm 40, that's printed on the next page for us. righteousness, you obeyed your Father's will on our behalf. When Satan would lead us to despair, give us confidence to cry, my Savior lived and died for me. In his name we pray, amen. We continue hearing the passion history of our Savior this evening. In the evening, Jesus' disciples reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. 
Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash your feet, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master. No is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Once you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. They all drank from it. Then Jesus said, The hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays him. It would be better for him if he had not been born. I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill the scripture. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. I tell you the truth. Whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. And whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After Jesus had said this, he was deeply troubled. His disciples were very sad. They stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant, and began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. One after the other, they began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, it is one of the twelve. The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The disciple whom Jesus loved was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned at his disciple and said, ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then, dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. 
Jesus answered, yes, it is you. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you are about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? A dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them are given the title benefactor. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater? the one who is at the table, or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Here ends our passion history this evening. We'll continue with our next hymn, the hymn, A Lamb Goes Uncomplaining Forth.
peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text this evening we find recorded in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 18, reading verse 12. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commanders and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him. These are the words of our sermon text this evening. My dear friends and our Savior Jesus Christ, much like today, I would imagine it was standard procedure back in Jesus' day to bind prisoners before you transport them. Binding their hands and their feet made life easier for everyone. Well, except for the prisoner, of course. Binding their hands and their feet eliminated the possibility of an unpleasant surprise. He kept the prisoner from thinking that he could make a break for it and try to escape. It would keep the prisoner from throwing his fist, maybe trying to get a little revenge on those who were capturing him. It helped the prisoner recognize that they were not in charge anymore. They were totally under the control of their captors. The crowd that gathered in Gethsemane that night, they bound Jesus. And while it might have been standard operating procedure, it was actually no standard operation. You have to admit, Binding Jesus that night, it was silly. It was ineffective. And really, it was completely unnecessary. Now, it was silly because, well, think about it for a moment. Why do you bind a prisoner's hands? Oftentimes, it's because the prisoner's hands have proven to be dangerous. Oftentimes, the prisoner had been arrested because he had done something evil with his hands. So you tie him up. And sometimes their hands were quite literally, in the words of the Old Testament, covered in blood. But what about Jesus' hands? Why bind up his hands? What harm had those hands ever done? You see, those hands had always been used to help and to heal and to bless. I mean, think about it. Jesus used those hands to take little children up in his arms and bless them. Jesus used those hands to heal the blind, the deaf, the mute, and the lame. Matter of fact, just a few minutes before this, Jesus had used those hands to heal the severed ear of a guy named Malchus. Remember Malchus? He was part of the crowd that had come to arrest Jesus, and yet Jesus used his hand to heal the ear of an enemy. Now consider for a moment what the psalm writer says about God's hand. You know the passage. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. So the last thing that you want to do to those gracious, gentle, giving, helping, healing hands is to bind them up. And yet we do something similar at times, don't we? We bind Jesus' hands when we fail to pray to him. When we don't pray for deliverance and healing, when we don't ask him to open up his hands, when we choose instead to try to handle it all by ourselves, we betray our weaknesses and our lack of faith. And so we really shouldn't be surprised if Jesus' hands remain still allowing us to find out the hard way, the foolishness of our own self-reliance. I think of what James says, you do not have because you do not ask God. And other times, we bind his hands 
forcefully. Oh, we choose to go on our own sinful way, and we want him to remain quiet, binding not only his hands and his feet, but especially his mouth, so that his words and commands are muffled by our rebellious nature. And we'll let him know when and if we're interested in hearing from him. Oh, if we get ourselves into some serious difficulty, oh, we'll ask him to bail us out then. But until then, Jesus just needs to stand in the corner, bound and mute. And when we start thinking that way, we're treading on very dangerous ground. Now, to see Jesus being bound by this mob in the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane, isn't there a part of you that's a little frightened? Oh, but not for Jesus, but for those who are doing the binding. You see, something similar had been tried in the past. Earlier in his ministry, when Jesus was preaching in the town of Nazareth, the crowd there decided they weren't going to bother binding up his hands and his feet and even going through a court of law. They decided they were going to march him right out of the city and throw him off the cliff there and kill him. Remember what happened? The Bible says he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Or think of just a few minutes right before our text. Jesus had asked that mob, who are you looking for? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. And that group that had intended to step forward and arrest him were told they drew back and fell to the ground. Jesus had shown them that he didn't even need to lift a finger to keep them from laying a finger on him, much less bind up his hands and his feet. And even if they did somehow manage to bind him, nothing could have held Jesus against his will. No amount of ropes or shackles or chains. And so as they bound him, as they cinch those ropes or chains on the very Son of God, you would almost expect them to be about as effective as trying to bind the Hulk with spaghetti. You would expect it to be about as effective as we hear in the Old Testament, Delilah bound Samson with fresh ropes, and we're told he snapped the ropes off his arms as if they were thread. You would expect that wouldn't take very long. They would see the impossibility of binding Jesus. But they did. They did bind him. And in one sense, the statement says they bound him. That's actually false. Or at the very least, it's incomplete. Oh, it may have seemed to those who were binding him and no doubt appeared to those who were watching as if the Roman soldiers and the Jewish leaders were taking control and they were binding Jesus. Probably a far more accurate description would be that Jesus allowed them to bind him. They couldn't do it without his consent. But Jesus consented. And in a sense, he really bound himself. And why? Because he had previously already bound himself to us. We were already bound by our sins so tightly that there was absolutely no way that we had any hope of escape. Think of the hymn that we just sang a moment ago. We sang, enslaved by sin and bound in chains, Beneath its dreadful tyrant sway and doomed to everlasting pain, we wretched, guilty captives lay. We had no way of escaping, no tools for freeing ourselves. And Jesus Christ chose to bind himself, whereas we say in the words of the Nicene Creed, he came down from heaven, was incarnated by the Holy Spirit, and was born of the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. 
That's why this binding by the chief priest and the Roman soldiers was totally unnecessary. Jesus wasn't going anywhere. He wasn't going to try to escape. He had already chosen, in the words of Peter, to bear our sins in his body. And by doing so, he had already chosen to be bound. Not just by Roman soldiers or Jewish leaders, but by sin and death. He allowed himself to be bound by that mob so that he might be bound by God on the cross. Forced to receive every last bit of just and righteous punishment from God for our sins. And then he gave himself over to death. Whose power to bind was unmatched. Now some people were bound very quickly by death at a very young age. Some people have held off death's efforts to bind them for years and years. And some people even cheated death, surviving accidents and illnesses that seem certain to defeat them. But they're only able to do it for so long. Eventually, death bound them like it binds everybody else. It bound them completely. Nobody ever escaped from its bonds. Jesus willingly placed himself into, well, like one of our hymns says, death strong bands. Strong bands for everybody. That is except for Jesus. Of course, maybe we're not supposed to talk too much about Easter during the Lenten season. But how can we not talk about Jesus being bound in Gethsemane and then being bound in death's strong bands without talking about how he also burst those bands on Easter Sunday? He burst those bands as effortlessly as Samson burst those ropes that were binding him and as completely as the prisoners who break their chains and grind them in the dust. Therefore, you and I are no longer bound by the guilt of our sin and the eternity, eternal death. You see, that's the first purpose for why Jesus freed us. Writer to the Hebrews talks about that. He says, Jesus died to free all those their, their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. The grave could not bind Jesus not going to bind you and me either. Oh, sure, our bodies are going to spend a little time in the grave, but they aren't going to stay there forever. Our fear of death falls away like burst binds. And Jesus also freed us so that we who've been raised from spiritual death to spiritual life would no longer be slaves to sin, bound by sin in our daily lives. Instead, he sets us free sets us free to do what the writer to the Hebrews encourages, to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and run the race marked out for us. But you know, it's an ongoing process for us because the devil is never going to stop trying to lasso us in with his temptations. You and I are not bound by him, though. Therefore, we can, through the power of the Holy Spirit living in us, do exactly what that passage says. We can daily throw off everything that hinders us. And we can actually run the race that's marked out for us, not just shuffling along like someone who has her feet tied up. Yes, we continually bind ourselves to Jesus Christ. We continually bind ourselves to the one who bound himself to us and allowed himself to be bound for us. And why? So that you and I would be free. Amen.
and the peace of God, which surpass all understanding, shall keep our hearts and minds with Christ Jesus. Amen. Continue standing. We'll join in prayer. Abide with us, Lord, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Abide with us and with your whole church. Abide with us in the evening of the day, in the evening of life, in the evening of the world. Abide with us in your grace and goodness, in your holy word and sacrament, in your comfort and blessing. Abide with us when we open. We are overcome by the night of sorrow and fear, by the night of doubt and affliction, by the night of bitter death. Abide with us and with all your people in time and in eternity. Amen. We join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. May God bless us so that all men may be seated. We'll continue with our last hymn, The Garden of Gethsemane. <coughs>
Thank you to those who served supper before service here. Uh, just glad you could join us for our service here tonight. I hope you join us next week. I believe Pastor Kelly from St. Peter will be our next preacher next week. Have a good rest of the